clansmen from different clan groups. They would normally be fighting with one another, but they put their differences aside because they're Jacobites, supporters of the royal family of Scotland, the Stuarts. The word Jacobite comes from the Latin Jacobus, Latin for James. So we're fighting for King James, the exiled Stuart King. They wear in their hearts a badge known as a white cockade. This was the badge of the Jacobite army. And the Highlanders that wore this in their heart signified they were supporting the exiled Stuart King. So although normally they'd be fighting against one another, they put their differences aside to fight under the common cause. Now being Highlanders, their names would be always in English but also in Gaelic. Their middle name would have a Gaelic thing. And the Gaelic word would tell you something about the person. What's your name, man? Ian Moore McKenna. Now Moore in Gaelic means big, so this is Big Ian. What's your name, lad? Angus Beg McFarlane. Oh, Beg in Gaelic means little. My problem. <laughs> so, we've got the, the big guy and the wee guy here as they were. Now, these two are actually from different clan groups, but they're actually quite happy to help out and do the show. I don't like him. You don't like him? <laughs> Why? <laughs> what did he do? Him and his clan came down our glen. They stole our cattle and their wives. You stole, you stole their cattle and their wives? They weren't your cattle back. Right. Well, they were back. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to start off by showing you some of the weapons of the Highland clans. We'll start off with this. Now, this is called the Scottish Claymore. In Gaelic, of course, more means big, so it simply means the big sword. Now, a sword like this would have been used in medieval times to cut through suits of armour and chainmail. The thing about a Scottish Claymore is it is actually surprisingly quite light. It's only six pounds in weight. Anyone that tells you a sword is heavy has never held a proper sword before. The thing about it was when you went into battle you could not carry a shield. So the top part of the sword was razor sharp, but the lower part was blunt. And the reason it was blunt was so you could grip the blade. Highlander, do you want to draw your sword so I can explain this? If you were in a battle and someone attacked you, you would grab a hold of the blade and using this to block the blow. You would then use the cross piece to knock the Highlander sword down to one side and the pommel's used to smack him. <laughs> he then falls back upon the ground, you whack him with the sword and all the oozing bits come out. Yeah. Now, of course, people often ask how did the Highlander carry such a weapon? He couldn't put it into his sword belt that it dragged on the ground as he walked. He couldn't simply pop it onto his shoulder like this. He's walking down the high street, someone cocks him from behind, he looks out to his, chops some poor passerby's head off. So you had a thing called a baldric. Now the baldric was a large piece of leather that slipped over the blade with a rope that went from the top to the bottom. You put the sword into the baldric and wore it on your back like so. And if you were ever attacked, you'd take it off your back, remove it from the scabbard and use it for the fighting. That's how most people would have done it. There was another gentleman did it slightly differently and his name was Mel Gibson. Some years ago, Mel Gibson did a film called Braveheart. And in that film, Mr. Gibson did something very unusual. He was seen wearing a claymore on his back during the film. But half through one of his scenes, he drew the claymore out of the ball brick like that. But it is physically impossible because your arm would have to be about five feet long to get the sword out. And it rules Mr. Gibson out because he's a very small man about that small. <laughs> so you had to take the sword off your back, remove it from the scabbard before he could use it. Now eventually this became outdated and it was replaced with another weapon called the basket broadsword. Now, the round basket is designed to protect your hand and on the front are these two small ears or lugs. Now they're not for decoration. The idea is to get your opponent's sword and trap his sword between the lugs. Then you can twist the sword out of his hand and use the pommel to smack him on the nose. It's almost me! <laughs> Now he carries two other weapons with him, a round wooden shield called a targe. The targe is covered in leather and heavily studded. Behind the targe he carries a long bladed knife called the dirk. The dirk is concealed behind the shield, but the bottom end sticks out to cut towards your opponent's body in battle. So he has a three-way fighting motion. He pushes you off balance with the shield, cuts to your body with the knife, then slices you down the middle with the sword. Not forgetting the battle cry. She was free! That's the most effective as well. <laughs> the Highlanders were very fearsome warriors. The kings and queens of Europe would employ them to fight in their various wars, because they were very fearsome. 
And as soldiers, they would have to learn to use muskets and pistols. This is a traditional pistol carried by the Highland clans. It's called the Scottish Dune Pistol. They made them in the town of Dune, close to Stirling. It's made entirely of metal, which makes it quite unusual. It's rather heavy. How it came about was the blacksmith in the town of Dune decided to make some guns. When he finished the first pistol, he thought, that's quite heavy. I don't think anyone will buy that. So he put it on the wall of his shop and forgot all about it. But one day a wealthy clan chief was riding through the town of Dune and his horse lost a shoe. While the chief was getting a new shoe placed on the horse, he noticed the pistol on display and took it down and bought it from the blacksmith. He asked him to make him some more. He this very quickly became a very popular item in the Highlands of Scotland and most of the powerful clan chiefs and wealthy clansmen would buy them. So why did they like them so much? Well, being made of metal, it was very hard to break. This meant if you didn't have any bullets for your gun, you could turn it around and club people on the head with it. But it has this little clip here, which allows you to put it onto your belt. This meant if you were ever attacked, you could quickly pull the pistol from your belt and fire it at your attacker. If you missed him, you could then throw the gun at his head. And while he was avoiding that, you'd have time to draw your sword. So that's your Scottish Duden pistol. However, the Highlanders also had to use muskets. And these are the type of muskets they would have. Now, the muskets could be fired in one of two ways. You could have what they called a powder horn to keep the gunpowder for the guns in, or you could make up a number of cartridges. And inside each of the cartridges at the top was the lead bullet. Now, so the bullet is inside here. So if you wish to fire the gun, the soldier would actually take the cartridge out and bite the end of the cartridge off, and then open this bit here, which is called the flash pan. This is where we get a phrase called the flash in the pan. He would put some of the powder into the flash pan and close down the lid. That traps the powder inside. There is a little hole drilled into the barrel. He then takes the rest of the cartridge and puts it into the barrel. Then using this, which is called the ramrod, you ram it all the way down to the He then has to replace the ramrod, and the gun was now ready to fire. Pulling back the hammer, he squeezes the trigger. And held just in here, what we're pointing out is a piece of flint. But when the flint would come forward, it would knock the top of the pan open and cause a spark. That spark would ignite the powder in the pan, travel through the small hole to the rest of the powder in the barrel, and the gun went off. And we might just get one to spark, maybe. Sorry, it's not loaded. So, just watch here, you see it uh, spark. And that's what makes the gun work. Now, of course, in the heat of battle, a soldier had to be able to load and fire this quickly. If you were a red coat soldier fighting against the Highlanders, you could load and fire this three times a minute. That was a requirement. But the Highland clans, although they couldn't load and fire the gun as quickly, they could actually be much better shots, for they used this for hunting and not just for warfare. But when you fired the gun, you held it very close to your face, and the gunpowder used to explode. It was quite common to burn the side of the soldier's face. Now, if you're a red coat soldier, you're not allowed to grow a beard. If you're a Highlander, you might grow a beard before you went into battle to give you some protection from the burning gunpowder. But eventually, the redcoats were allowed to grow their facial hair on the side of their face to protect them from the discomfort of the gunpowder. Soldiers would nickname their facial hair sideburns. And that's where the phrase originated from. So sideburns were grown by soldiers to protect them from the flash in the pan from a brown vest musket. But of course, the Highlanders uh, were always forever fighting and using various weapons. They did, however, have... Uh, oh, what are you doing? Enough fighting. Tell them about this. Oh, the ski and do. All right. Now, this is the ski and do. In Gaelic, it means the black knife. It takes its name from the fact the handle is made of black bogwood. People tend to make these things out of all kinds of different pieces of wood now, but if it's not made, made of black bogwood, it isn't a proper ski and do. And unlike today, where people tuck them in their sock, the Highlander carried them in a breast pocket of their jacket or waistcoat. This was used to cut and eat your food. If you went to another Highlander's house, he didn't have forks and knives to give you, 
so you had to have a skiing do with you to cut and eat the food you would be offered. And although it wasn't a weapon, it could only be used as a weapon as a last resort. Let me give you a little scenario. I go to this Highlander's house on a very stormy rainy day. I'm looking for shelter and I knock on his door. A uh, Highlander, could I come in and shelter from the rain? Oh, I suppose so. All oh, right, okay, is that all right? You'll have to leave your weapons at the door. And that was the old tradition in the Highlands. You had to leave your sword and pistol at the front door, and the only thing you were allowed to carry into the Highlander's house was your ski and do. You would then pop it onto the table, and that indicates to the Highlander you would like something to eat. But he'll then ask me a question, he'll answer it himself. You have had your tea? No, I haven't asked any chance of a bite to eat. Manger. <laughs> uh, what have you got? Uh, venison. Venison? Yeah. Oh, I'd love a bit of venison. But uh, not for you, salmon. Oh, salmon? All oh, right. Now, I've been insulted, because in the old days, if you were given salmon, it was known as a poor man's food. The wealthy people of Edinburgh wouldn't eat it, they called it peasant's food. So by being given salmon, it proves that I'm not as important as many other people who visit the Highlander. Well, I might be enjoying a nice bit of salmon, and someone else comes into the house and starts to torment me, because I don't have any weapons to protect myself. So I'm going to have to use my ski and do as a weapon. Yeah. Well, the only trick was to grab your attacker by the ear, put him on the table, stab him in the neck, push him out the way, and carry on with your food. <laughs> so, although it's not a weapon, it could be used as a weapon, but only as a last resort. Enough fighting. Oh, right. Oh, right. Try yeah. that. Ah, right. Now, the Highlander eats from a wooden bowl and a cup. Okay, uh, any ideas what the cup's made from? cup's made from your man, any guesses? Maybe, I don't know. Where are the cups made from, any guesses? Horn, yes, uh -huh. a kind of horn it would be. Well, it's actually, it's a cow horn. It's a cow horn cup. Now, we do do a lot of talks to school groups, and we often ask the children if they know what this is made from. And one day, a little girl <coughs> put her hand up and says, I know what that's made from. She says, it's made from an elephant's tusk. And I thought, I have to educate the young lady. Where do you see elephants in Scotland, I say? She goes, Edinburgh Zoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was your drinking cup made from a cow horn cup and a wooden bowl. What do you eat in this island? This is called your sporn. And in the sporn, you can carry things like oatmeal, just like porridge. Some oatmeal in there, some water. Sometimes a wee bit whiskey. Whiskey? Uh, uh, whiskey? Uh, no. Alright, no for you. Alright. <laughs> This is what most Highlanders used to wear upon their feet, a very simple piece of footwear called a curin. And it's a simple piece of leather stitched up the back. It's like this lady here, yes, it's modern and it good. Now, if you were to walk from here to perhaps to Inverness, you probably would wear a hole in your shoe. And you couldn't afford to buy a nice pair of buckled shoes like mine, so you would go to the shoemaker or tanner and buy a piece of leather. You would go outside his shop and take your shoes off, take the lace out, Put the pattern onto the leather, cut out the shape, punch the holes, lace it up, and you made your own shoes. Now, after the Battle of Culloden in 1746, many Highlanders moved to America and Canada, and they continued to do this. People used to approach them to ask them what they were wearing on their feet. The problem was most of the Highlanders couldn't speak English, they could only speak Gaelic, so they couldn't understand what they were being asked. So people would wander up and ask them what they were wearing on their feet. And the Highlander used to answer in Gaelic. He would look at where the man was pointing and go, Mokassin, which is Gaelic for my foot. And this is where the Americans get a word called moccasin. It's not actually a Native American Indian word at all. It's a Gaelic word the Scots introduced to America and Canada, and that's where it came from. But the one thing that made them rather different was the way in which they dressed. Volunteers, what about you? You can help me out. Come here. What's your name? Come here and help me out, Ewan. Yeah. Where are you from, Ewan? Uh, Brilliant. Okay. Do you want to help me out for the last part of the show? I'd like to dress you to look like a Highlander. Okay? Mm -hmm. You ever seen a picture of Mel Gibson in Braveheart? I'm going to make you look like Mel Gibson in a Braveheart. <laughs> now, I chose you because you're the same height as Mel Gibson, so that's good. <laughs> now, do you want to give me a jacket to your mum while I set this up? Right, now, the Highlanders in the old days didn't wear kilts as we know today. They wore this thing, which is called a filly mower. Now the Highlanders each are wearing a filly mower, and it's one big piece of tarp material. Now, to put this on, you have to lay it down upon the ground. This takes a little bit of time to do. 
how we do volunteer I stand this here beside me and my friend now. I'm going to show you how this is done. The material's laid on the ground, and then we've got to pleat it up, and this takes a little bit of time to do. And the clever thing about this was, it doesn't matter if you're small, medium, or large, one size fits everywhere. Does that fit me? Uh, no. You got a pair? Yeah. Cloth, we use that for it, by the way. Keep the 